Good afternoon, folks. This is going to be a zinger. Some people made some videos and stuff, some stuff going around that there's even Catholics who want to say that either Pope, Fran Pope Francis is either the Antichrist or the false prophet, and he's neither one. He cannot be either one. By the dictates of Scripture and by the promises given to the church, he cannot be, all right? And listen, I'm frustrated by a lot of stuff he says, and I understand that he's kind of like a closet globalist mason or whatever, but we got to be very careful about falling into the idea that, like, we have a say over who the Pope is in the sense that we could get him to you know, quit or depose himself or, or like be elected out or whatever. We can't be treating the Pope as if he's one of our elected officials, elected officials in our civic government. Okay. It's not the case. And like, go be a Presbyterian if you want that. I'm frustrated by stuff he says, but like, um, that's not going to change my belief in the faith for that. But why can't he be the Antichrist? Well, he can't be the Antichrist because the defining principle of the Antichrist is that the Antichrist, the Antichrist, like, you know, anybody who's a liar or like whatever can be considered a Antichrist, but the Antichrist. He denies the divinity. He denies, he, de he denies the divinity of Jesus Christ. He denies the crucifixion. He denies the resurrection. Who does this? Muslims. Islam pretty much um, was intended, in their view at least, to be a correction of Christianity. In the fact that they believe Christians were deceived into believing, well, actually, they believe Allah deceived Christians into believing that Jesus had been crucified and, and um, died and resurrected. But Islam, Islamic doctrine teaches that Jesus did not die. He was not crucified, nor did he die. And uh, he was not divine. They believe he never claimed to be divine and that that was a, a misinterpretation by the Christians. But they believe he was raised up to heaven to be with Allah and that he was going to come back down to earth in the end times to fight with the Mahdi, which is like the Islamic savior, um, and form an Islamic kingdom governed by Islamic law in uh, the world, specifically in the Middle East, okay? And um, he's going to advocate for Islam. He's going to advocate on behalf of this Islamic savior, specifically to the Jewish people and to the rest of the world, and he's going to make miracles and stuff like that. Um, signs and wonders from heaven that would deceive even the elect if they could. So you people need to be very careful about who you're trying to paint the Antichrist because you're going to be deceived by this. Scripture says many people are going to be deceived. And everybody's looking at Europe. Everybody's looking at the Pope. And with all these people looking there, I don't see how they're going to be deceived if they're staring right at it unless they're missing the whole point that it's the Levant. It's not the Adriatic. And if you look through the Old Testament, all these prophecies about these countries fighting against Israel, oppressing oppressing God's people, it's always these same countries. It's e Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and Turkey and, and Iran and Arabia and Tyre and Sidon, Lebanon, Syria. It's all the same countries, and it's always going to be the same thing. It's like those short-term prophecies, they were fulfilled in the short term, but they all refer to the long-term prophecies as well. So I don't know why all of a sudden, you know, Spirit of the Antichrist would pick up and uh, move to Europe and then become the Pope and stuff like that. Like, it's, it's wrong, it's not scriptural, and it's blasphemous. So he's not going to be the Antichrist, nor is he going to be the false prophet. False prophet comes out of the land, the Holy Land, Israel, and the fact that Israel become its own country again in the last century when they weren't a country 100 years ago, well, that's pretty clear evidence that prophecy is being fulfilled at, well, some sort of rates, too slow for the evangelicals, I guess, but, you know, too fast for the Catholics. But um, the fact that Israel is a country again now and that the false prophet is going to come out of the land and the fact that you have this Islamic ideology over here that says Jesus Esau is going to come back down from heaven because he never died because they deny his divinity and resurrection and crucifixion. He's going to come back down to Israel and advocate on behalf of Islam and convert a bunch of people to the faith. By, he's going to deceive many. By peace, he will deceive many. Islam doesn't mean peace, though. Islam actually means submission in Arabic. But by peace, he will deceive many. Yeah, they, they will. And they're going to be in the same region. And we already see the workings of that. Oh, Islam, it's a religion of peace. It's a religion of peace. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and like here we are, all these Catholics uh, trying to paint the Pope as their as the Antichrist or the Harlot of Babylon, and I have a big problem with this because it's wrong, it's wrong, and no matter what Francis says or or does to, to make you upset, that like he's not going to be the Antichrist if he stopped praying in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and says that Jesus never res ne never resurrected, but that was an allegory, then maybe I'll get a little bit nervous, but like that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I think Protestants, of course, you know, you guys always have a vested interest in painting the Pope as the Antichrist or the harlot of Babylon because you left the church and you need to retroactively go back in Scripture and find a way to justify you leaving the church. Extra ecclesia nulla salis. You guys left the church and, like, you're out of luck, all right? You guys got to come back. Come home before you die. Come home before all this stuff kicks off and you realize how wrong you are because you Protestants, a lot of you are going to convert to Islam. 
And you can sit there and swear up and down that you're not going to. But when you see Jesus come to the land of Israel, what looks like Jesus at least, and he's bringing fire down from heaven and he's advocating on behalf of Islam to the Jews and the rest of the world, like I bet some of you are going to convert. I bet a lot of you are going to convert, actually, because a lot of people are going to be deceived. And you've been looking at the Pope the whole time. Uh, yeah, it's going to go wrong. And I bet a lot of you rad trads are probably going to end up getting tripped up, too, because you're going to admire the... The devotion that the Muslims have to their faith, you're going to admire the conservative elements of their society, the modesty of the women and, and like the piety towards their own religion. You're going to admire some of that, the lack of filth in their society as far as like uh, the, the, you know, gay movement and abortion and all this. Like they don't, they don't stand for any of that. And some of you rad trads that better going to fall into that. You're going to admire that about the Muslims and uh, you're going to be deceived too. So um, as far as the harlot of Babylon and stuff like that, it's a mystery, mystery Babylon or whatever. And I, I think it's a mystery because John couldn't really like recognize who it was necessarily. Um, and, you know, there's some debate about that. I don't want to act like that's a authoritative opinion. It's just kind of my own opinion. But the fact that it's a mystery Babylon, um, I think, is tied to who the Antichrist is, who this beast kingdom is. And I think it's very easy to make, make a very watertight, airtight case for the fact that the Middle East and um, Islam in particular is going to be the source of this sea beast, this Gentile kingdom that denies the divinity of Christ and oppresses Israel and beats down the whole world and changes the dates and times and doesn't respect the desire of women and uh, makes war against the strongest countries and uh, speaks blasphemies to God and all this other stuff. Mark of the beast, you know, in the name of Allah. Bismillah. It's, gonna, it's on people's foreheads and it's on people's like right hands already. It's a whole different creed. It's a whole different system of laws that people swear allegiance to. So you have got that ready-made paradigm there. So if you want to figure out who Babylon is, look at that and say, okay, who's controlling this beast? Who's who's riding on the Antichrist right now? Who's riding on the seven-headed beast or whatever? And like, you know, there's a little bit of debate about that. I got my own theories, but I can't account for every element of the prophecy. So like, I'm a little hesitant to say, but I mean, like, man, I would look at some of these decadent Western countries. You see us trying to fly gay flags at all our embassies across the world now. All this stuff, all the abortion and filth and rot and error and sin and scandal and just all these horrors that come from the West and the United States in particular. You can make a very strong case for that, but the Vatican, no. And uh, another thing I've been reading on a little bit more is that the two witnesses in uh, Revelation, which I haven't really uh, looked into very much, but I've, I've read and uh, watched some videos and... Uh, um, come to the realization that uh, at least one of them is going to be Elijah because Elijah never died. He was taken up to heaven. He wore sackcloth and he brought fire down from heaven. And specifically what he did is he preached against the prophets of Baal. And if you research the history of the worship of Allah in Mecca, um, Muhammad didn't introduce this deity. He was actually one of the deities in the in the Kaaba, the, the box that they walk around uh, during the Hajj. And he got rid of all the deities and said, this one is the one deity. or Allah, the God, that's what it means. And um if you trace the, the lineage of that deity all the way back, it's Baal. It's these same people that warred against Israel back in the Old Testament who worshipped Baal, they worshipped Moloch, they did all this stuff. It's the same deity. And the fact that Elijah prophesied specifically against the prophets of Baal and um, the fact that he never died, that he was taken up, and that he's gonna he's prophesied to come back in the end times in sackcloth and perform signs and wonders from heaven and, and prophesy against the beast in Jerusalem, it specifically says in the city in, in, where indeed their Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. I don't know how you could possibly argue that it's not. So why would he come to Jerusalem and prophesy against the prophets of Baal wearing sackcloth and uh, performing signs and wonders um, if, if like the Catholic Church is, is the Antichrist or whatever, the Pope's way, way over here in the West, or well, I don't know, whatever. Whatever direction the West is to you, but if the Pope's over here in Vatican City or whatever, why would they be in uh, Jerusalem prophesying against the against the prophets of Baal? Baal is Allah. Muslims worship Baal. Um, you know, you can swear up and down that it's not true, but go research the lineage. It's true. Elijah, probably Enoch are going to come back and be the two witnesses because every man has to die, and they haven't died. They're going to come back to Jerusalem to prophesy against the Antichrist in the end times, and uh, they're going to be killed for it. They'll be the two witnesses. <clears throat> Not a Eurocentric story. The Bible's never been Eurocentric. It's written from the perspective of Jerusalem, <clears throat> geographically as well as spiritually. And, uh, you know, everybody wants to say it's a resurgence of the Roman Empire and stuff like that. But what I guess most people fail to remember is that most of these countries in the Middle East and North Africa, Turkey even, that um, are now under Muslim rule, they used to be Christian countries and they were taken over by Islam. It's like kind of what the seven churches in, uh, you know, Revelation, those are Muslim lands now. Those churches don't exist because the Muslims came and, t and conquered that land. And um, as far as a resurgence of the Roman Empire, it's a, well, it's a resurgence of the Roman Empire in the sense that it contains those uh, 
lands of North Africa and, and the Levant and Turkey and stuff like that. Those were all under Roman rule back in the day. But, you know, it's a resurgence of that. It's a resurgence of the Babylonian Empire, of the Egyptians, of the um, Grecian Empire, in, in the sense that it ruled that, those same regions too. And the Persian Empire too. And it's interesting to note that the Roman Empire never controlled uh, the extent of the Persian Empire, but the Islamic Caliphate did. The Islamic Caliphate, I think, is the only empire that actually encompassed all of the regions mentioned in like the old testament and of all the former empires and stuff like that so that's where you need to look like a lot of stuff happened between uh the fall of the roman empire and our time now there was like kind of this whole roiling muslim thing going on and then they've kind of been beat down for a while because of like colonialism and the rise of the west and stuff like that and now they're coming back again as if they were like you know wounded and then their their wound is healed but um, there's debate on that prophecy too. I don't want to act like that's an authoritative opinion, but like, man, I'm, I'm, I will not bend on this Islamic paradigm because it's just too watertight. You go back to Daniel, you go back to all the books of the old Testament down to the crescent moon symbols on the, on the camel's necks of the, uh, prophets of Baal and the, and the pagan countries back in the old Testament, man, it all lines up, but like Catholics, Pope Francis is not the antichrist and he's not the Harlot of Babylon, and he's not the false prophet. Stop trying to make everything so Western-centric. If anything, the West is Babylon, and it will fall at the hand of the Persians, at, at the hand of the Antichrist. All right, so prepare for that. Prepare to, like, you know, prepare to suffer, because we're going to suffer. And, um, you know, it sure be nice to, I don't know how you Protestants think that uh, if the Catholic Church just got destroyed and, and then you guys could just be happy Protestants and then, you know, you could face down the New World Order all on your own. The New World Order is not going anywhere, all right? It's a false, it, it's a, it's a false religion, no doubt, and it is demonically influenced. And, like, there's, like, probably billions of demons. They have a third of the angelic host fell. So, like, they can kind of have some stuff, like, in the works or whatever. But, like, I think, I think you'd be hard-pressed to say that Islam, because of its uh, theological claims, its uh, geographical presence, and uh, its historical... Um, adversity towards Israel and Christianity and the idea of Jesus being divine. I, I, man, it's that's what it is, especially coupled with their eschatological uh, events in the end time with those two figures that come before the end of the age and the one uh, they claim to be Jesus that like advocates on behalf of Islam. Ready-made paradigm, all right? It's not the Adriatic, it's the Levant. Look to the East and look to the Old Testament. It's the same story, same stuff. You know, and there's man, not really going to be many surprises in the... In that way, although a lot of people are going to be surprised when they when they realize it was the same story all along, and they were trying to like jam all these pieces together that didn't really go together. Um, but man, man, gets me right riled. All these people going to saying all this other stuff or whatever. <sighs> and I mentioned the other day how how a lot of Catholics here have said that Rome will be destroyed, but. Um, I do believe that. I think there's a lot of credence to that. Certainly the uh, apparitions at Fatima and, and La Salette and these other apparitions, which, of, of course, Protestants don't have access to because they, you know, reject the Blessed Virgin Mary despite there being a very strong um, Catholic element to the Book of Revelation in particular with Christ appearing in these different forms and, and, and the woman clothed with the, with the sun and, and, and there's all Eucharistic um, references and stuff in Revelation, it's pretty much like a Catholic Mass. It read Scott Hahn or even Taylor Marshall speaks about this um, a lot, that it's very Catholic in nature. And, and like it's just hysterical that Protestants want to take the book of Revelation to uh, be a condemnation of the Catholic Church. But uh, hey, if, if it's true that Rome gets destroyed, that doesn't necessarily mean that St. Peter's is going to be destroyed. And I think that'd be a pretty powerful testament if Rome you know, continues along its way back to its pagan roots. They got like naked porno pornographic advertisements all over the streets that like, you know, scandalize faithful priests that are in Rome going to school or, or, or dealing with stuff there in Rome. They're going to Rome and they have all this naked stuff. They get spit on and stuff like that. Like, Rome being pagan doesn't mean that the church is going to fall too. And that'd be a very powerful testament, I think, if uh, Rome burned to the ground and St. Peter's was the only thing standing out there. What would you say then? I bet you 50 bucks it'll happen. But, uh, I think that's enough for this video. There, there's going to be more because I, I'm riled up. I've been thinking about this stuff for years, but wasn't really sure if it was like a good way to go about it. But no, I'm riled up. Everybody's talking about the Antichrist now. Everybody's talking about the false prophet and one world government. And, you know, COVID's the mark of the beast or the vaccine is this and stuff like that. Like, I'm sick of it. All right. Like, I've tried very hard to, 
like approach this stuff with a with an earnest mind. And I'm not saying, of course, that like I have it all figured out, but like I got it figured out better than a lot of you people do, certainly. And it's funny because uh, when I was at school, University of Dallas, I had some close Muslim friends from high school that I still talked with, and um, a lot of students there at UD, they they were kind of like talking bad about Muslims and stuff like that, and uh, it, it irritated me because I was like, you know, I'm really close with these Muslims, and they're very pious and sincere people, and uh, like. You know, I don't really like that these people are talking down to them. So I started researching Islam to try and uh, vindicate the Muslims, to try and, like, like have a good name for them. But what I found, conversely, was that Islam, theologically speaking, is much more sinister than I ever gave it credit for and that anybody really gives it credit for. I mean, it, it, the view's kind of just been like they're these third-world goat herders with a few bad apples and they got lucky and, you know, hit, hit us hard on 9-11 or whatever, but, like, it's very sinister, the claims that they make, and, and all the stuff that lines up with, with the prophet Daniel and stuff, changing the dates and the times, and, and uh, the, the regions that they occupy now, and the oppression of women, and the um, speaking arrogantly to powerful nations and stuff like that, like, this is all in scripture, and it, it all fits, it all fits to a T, the regions that the, that the, the stuff is going to take place, the, even the, the hatred of Israel, the, the hatred of the woman, the denial of Jesus' divinity, it, it, it's all there, but... Um, ironically, when I tried to research Islam in order to uh, tell people that Muslims were good, that's when I when I uh, found the truth about it, and uh, it was very humbling. God certainly does work in mysterious ways, but we need to pray hard for the Muslims. This is certainly not an endorsement of being uh, rude or mean to Muslims, and um, we could, in in a lot of ways, um, learn from the devotion they have to their own faith. I mean, we have nothing to learn from them theologically because it's you know evil error. But uh, the devotion that the Muslims have to their faith is commendable, and we should um, seek to at least emulate them in that respect in relation to our own faith. But pray for the Muslims and try and, try and uh, help them to, to um, see the truth of Christ, the truth of the Catholic Church, because of the, the nature of Islam, it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's uh, very hard and very terrifying and dangerous in a lot of cases for Muslims to apostatize from Islam and come to the one true faith. So, so let's always extend the hand to them when, when they make that um, when they make that leap. Let's not go out there and say that Islam's a uh, religion of peace and that it's a uh, valid religion too. That's why I was pretty pissed off about the Pope going to a uh, to to Iraq, the heart of the heart of, you know, ancient Babylon with, with these clerics and stuff like that. But no, we, we need to help them out. But hey, that's all I got for now. But there's going to be more. Again, I'm riled right up. It's time to let it all flow out. Just in time for everything to kick off. But don't be silly. Read the scriptures and uh, understand what, what like they're trying to say. Um, prepare yourself to suffer. We're all going to suffer a lot. More than we can bear unless we have we have the grace of God in our lives and the, 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 the faith in his one true church. So keep that in mind and uh, I'll take care.